my brother had a tape of the Beatles live from the Hollywood Bowl and he was playing it and you could hear like the crowd, <sighs> you know, just nonstop. And he's playing. I'm like, what the hell is that? You know? Yeah. So he's right. Like from the Hollywood Bowl. I'm like, Jesus Christ, listen to that reaction. And I was just taken by the reaction, you know, it really just hit me back. You know, I couldn't believe they were screaming so loud and for so long, you know? And I'm like, what's going on? Like, what did I miss with these Beatles? <laughs> you know? Junctures from Liverpool, England. The Beatles have held this title for eight years. My model of business is the Beatles. You know, they were four very talented guys. <laughs> Welcome back to the Here, There, and Everywhere podcast. I'm your host, Jack Lawless. Today we're talking with the legendary comedian, writer, producer, actor, podcast, and talk show host, Larry Wilmore. Larry has written for and produced numerous classic TV shows, including In Living Color and The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, and he created The Bernie Mac Show. On top of being a creative genius, Larry has also been an enthusiastic Beatles fan for quite some time, and I'm thrilled to have him on. So, Larry, welcome to the show. Hey, Larry, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. My pleasure, Jack, young Jack. (laughs) How are you doing today? Good, good. I'm always, always happy to talk about the lads from Liverpool. Which, you know, I wanted to say in the beginning, I actually do an impression of all four Beatles. No way. So one of the two people. Do you really? I got got them all. Can we hear it? Sure. You want to start with that? Yeah, let's start it off with the impressions. Well, see, the impressions, the key to doing the Beatles is the voices exist in different parts of your mouth, you know, when you're doing it. So like, you know, when you're doing Paul, you know, he's up there. He's kind of at the top, you know, like Paul never knows anything. I don't know. You know, I mean, who knows? (laughs) I mean, it could be, but we just don't know. I mean, we're just Beatles. We're just doing the music. I mean, we don't know. (laughs) Everything goes up there, you know, and then you have to come down to your nose. If you're going to do John Lennon, he's in the (laughs) nose, you know, he's right there. You know, I'm I'm not comparing myself to Jesus as a person, you know, God is a thing. Oh, that's or whatever perfect. it is. I just said what I said, you know. <laughs> and it's then if you want to do judge, then you have to go into your mouth to do judge. <laughs> he's in the mouth there, you know, and he's he pronounces more of his words. He finishes the whole word, you know. I can play it, Paul, if you want me to. I don't have to play it at all, whatever. <laughs> it is that will please you, Paul. Oh, that's solid. And then you go to the back of your Throat for Ringo. Ringo's uh, hello, lad. You know, right back there. You know, it's just an octopus has gotten in the shade. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that was so impressive. <laughs> but there you go. It's all it is. You know, I don't know. I mean, who knows? You know, <laughs> I don't. It's not something we can answer. You know. Oh, that's classic. <laughs> <laughs> Paul's always. He'd never do the. I mean, you know, in five years. You know, we may not be able to even write songs. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so you must have been practicing those impressions for a long time nah it just it's just something that you just i don't know you just start doing day you go oh i can actually do all the beatles you know paul always does the middle finger scratch along the nose too he throws <laughs> yes, that in exactly. there yeah. so larry how long have you been a beatles fan for so i have see i grew up during beetle mania okay but i wasn't a beatles fan growing up they were kind of all around. I was born in like 1961, right? And so as a kid, you know, I knew tangentially, if that's a word, of the Beatles, but they weren't, like my parents didn't play the Beatles in the house. You know, you heard them in the world. Beatlemania was going on, but I wasn't, as a kid, enamored of that. I was really too young, you know, but my first image of the Beatles was the Beatles cartoon, to be honest with you. Like, that's my earliest memories of seeing them in the cartoon form, thinking, oh, that looks cool, you know, and uh, they would have the lyrics on the screen and that type of thing, you know, and uh, Yellow Submarine stands out. The only songs I remember growing up, really, that kind of stuck with me was probably Yellow Submarine for sure, Let It Be, and maybe Yesterday. Like, that's my experience of the Beatles. They were kind of around, but I wasn't really into them. I was, you know, 
there was different music played in my house. I was into different things, went through the whole seventies, you know, not really much aware of it. And it wasn't until John Lennon died, actually, ironically, that maybe a year after that or six months or something, my brother had a tape of the Beatles live from the Hollywood Bowl and he was playing it and you could hear like the crowd, you know, just nonstop. And he's playing. I'm like, what the hell is that? You know? Yeah. So he's right. Like on the Hollywood Bowl. I'm like, Jesus Christ, listen to that reaction. And I was just taken by the reaction, you know, it really just hit me back. You know, I couldn't believe they were screaming so loud and for so long, you know? And I'm like, what's going on? Like, what did I miss with these Beatles? You know? <laughs> and so what I decided to do, I was really struck by it. I listened to that thing over and over and it was just, I just, you know how you, that feeling where it just kind of hooks you in, you know, and I just wanted to know more. And I, I couldn't believe that I had missed all this discography, you know, that the whole experience of it. So what I decided to do, oh, I saw this great documentary at the time. It was hosted by Malcolm McDowell. And what was it called? It may have just been called The Beatles or something like that. But it was great, especially in his face, you know, Liverpool. Not much happened in Liverpool. It's a <laughs> soccer teams and, you know, <laughs> until four lads came out. You know, and you know, that Malcolm McDowell classic voice, you know. And just learning about not just who the Beatles were, but kind of where music was at the time, what they did to it and all that. Watching that documentary helped me to understand the Beatles kind of role, you know. Mm. And then I decided after watching, I'm like, this thing's amazing. I decided to go start from the beginning. So I bought each album in order. Oh, wow. I went to the record store, found the first Beatles albums, like the early ones, and went in the order they were released. And I would listen to it over and over until I was done. And then I would go buy another one, you know? Wow. And so I went in order and I got the experience of it consecutively. So I got to graduate through Beatle music, you know, and learn about it. Like, and it was amazing. You know, I was so completely hooked and enthralled. It, it's been full like that ever since it's never waned. That's like almost 40 years now that I've had that appreciation for it. And that, so this, when I was working on Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, I was writing on the show. One of the writers said, yeah, you know, I, I was listening, I heard the Beatles the other day. I'm not really into the Beatles. I was thinking of maybe a check in them out. Says, do you have any suggestions? I said, yes, <laughs> do I do start from the beginning, you know, go, go from album to album. I gave him that advice and he took the advice. I saw him like a year or so later. He said, Oh, Larry, I wanted to tell you, I did what you said about the Beatles. Thank you. He goes, it was unbelievable. He says, you're right. They're they're. How did I miss this? They're unbelievable. I go, yeah, right. It's true. But isn't that funny? You know, just going through that, what it did was it gave me an appreciation, not just of songs, but of their musicology, you know, of how much they graduated and changed with every album. They went forward with it and the things they're writing about early on and how that changed so quickly. I mean, the Beatles were only a, a famous band for like seven years. From 63 yeah. to 70. And in the United States, it was six, 64 to 70. That's not a long period of time when you think about it. Today, and to, today, that's one album by a group or two. Yeah. You know, let alone all the Beatles put out. You know, it's crazy. Was your choice to go through them chronologically in, intentional? Or did you just yes. find yourself doing that? No, 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 no. It was intentional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to experience them, you know, and see just what it's like to experience it. And it was great because I was a blank slate, you know. Right. There were so many songs that I didn't know. Like I said, I just knew the surfacey ones that everybody knows about, you know, just the smattering ones. When I watched the uh, the documentary, of course, I heard more, but I didn't know what they, a lot of them, I didn't know that much about them. So they just kind of went in and went out. But when I experienced the albums, then I saturated myself in the albums and really got to know it. And then in the early ones, of course, the singles were separate from the albums and the English ones, you know, and, and the stores were selling the English albums at that time, too. Because there was a resurgence of them. So you could buy the album, the English Parlophone albums, you know, of the Beatles back then in album form, which was great. Because when the Beatles first came out, they only had the capital versions of them. So you couldn't get with the Beatles. You had to get Meet the Beatles. But Meet the Beatles, by the way, is a fantastic album. Yes. But 
But with the Beatles is the first thing, you know, it's the way they intended it to come out and that kind of stuff. So, but I also bought the American albums too. I did both. <laughs> so this is how much of a Beatle nut I was. I bought both albums, you know, as I'm going forth. So I had both rubber soles, you know, and both, both revolvers, you know, and, you know, the uh, here, you know, yesterday and today, that one, you know, and all the Beatles second album, which is kind of a made up thing. It's right. such a bizarre, like. <laughs> patched together like what do you mean the Beatles second album what does that even mean you know <laughs> um but uh yeah that's how I got an appreciation for their musicology as well as just being a fan of their personalities so so what kind of music were you listening to before you jumped into the Beatles and how does that music compare to what you heard from them yeah so I grew up my father was into like everything from jazz to kind of to even Motown to Atlantic Records soul music you know i grew up in a lot of that not much rock and roll in my house and even in my teen years i was more into the what was happening in soul later on in disco some of that the early hip-hop stuff that was coming out which we called mix music during that time you know where you would find breaks and you would just mix it and that kind of stuff and you know everybody from stevie wonder to earth Wind and fire to you know all oh, the, you know, parliament, you know, funk, that kind of stuff, you know, pop music, you know, was on most of the radio at the time. I didn't listen to much rock. I didn't have much of a vocabulary in rock music, even though it was most of what was played. And I went to a Catholic school from about fifth grade on. And so there's I was around a lot of what I'll call the white music. That's what we call the rock and roll at the time, you know? And so I had my black music that I cared about. I think it was that white stuff, you know? Right. So that's what I considered like Led Zeppelin and all that stuff. Oh, that's that white boy shit. I didn't like listening to that white boy stuff. You know? <laughs> I'm listening to Stevie Wonder. These, these motherfuckers don't know what this is. You know? <laughs> so it was kind of, it was almost territorial, you know, that type of thing, you know? But you would hear things like in pop music, but I wouldn't think that much about it you know so by by the time I heard the Beatles at that time that was early 80s so yeah I wasn't listening to anything in particular but that's kind of the road I had been on at that time the early rap was just starting and the 80s music was just forming so you know I was into a lot of dance music from New York and that kind of stuff I think during that time when you started listening to the Beatles in the 80s, was that more interesting to you than what was going on in other music at that time? Thousand percent. Thousand percent more interesting. And I think a lot of it was because of the their personalities too. You know, I was kind of taken by both of them. It was just a, a new world to me, orally, A-U-R. I just, you know, and it, some of it was a little bit nostalgic too at that time, you know, some of the sounds. And... Yeah, I don't know how to describe. It. I don't know why it caught me the way it did. You know, to be, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. It yeah. just does it. It does its thing, and then you're just stuck. You know. Yeah, it's just different. Yeah, and it's not like the other music of the time because I never felt that way about the Rolling Stones. You know, or yeah, you know, a lot of music from the time feels so dated. I can't listen to it more than passing. You know, that type of thing. I'm not going to seek it out. Right. You know, some of it I was more familiar with the Beatles, but uh, you know. I had no interest in continuing, you know, listening to the Beatles have always been different. It doesn't matter what mood I'm in or what's going on on the radio. I can always listen to like, if I fell, you know, it always sounds fresh to me. It doesn't sound old. Mm -hmm. That was 1964. You know, that's crazy. It should yeah. sound old to my ears, but it doesn't. You know, I always have that same exact thought, and and I was born in 96. Right. So all of the music that I knew growing up still sounds a lot older than the Beatles, like Oasis and all that late 90s, early 2000s music. Yeah. Somehow the Beatles still sound newer and fresher, even than the stuff that's getting put out today. It's, it's, it's interesting because you can go to their work in the 70s, which is kind of interesting, because some of it you can listen to in some context but in some ways a lot of that feels older than the stuff they did with the beatles or feels dated yes in a way that beatles stuff doesn't you know and that's fascinating to me too you know 
the it feels the closer they were to the Beatles, like like Paul's first album, McCartney, is the best sounding album to me in terms of not being dated. But it's right when he was still with the Beatles, and the same with like George, All Things Must Pass, you know, and Plastic Ono. All those sound the best of their post Beatles stuff in terms of being dated, and I think it's because they were still basically Beatles when they did it. <laughs> I mean, isn't that weird? Like, and they wrote a lot of good stuff. I mean, Band on the Run, it's a classic album, you know. Yeah. He Paul was far from the Beatles there, but sorry, maybe I'm amazed. Sounds more enduring, you know, in some ways. You know, it has a sound to it that's just different. Yes, I agree with you. Band on the Run, as great as it is, it sounds like it's from the seventies. Exactly. And silly love songs sounds like it's from the seventies. Absolutely. But maybe I'm amazed. It's a little different. It's like yeah. you can't put a year on maybe I'm amazed. You could go. Well, I think it was the early 70s, but was it the 60s? What was the year? Silly Love Songs, 1975. I don't care what anybody says. Like, yeah. like that's like, <laughs> like the horns in it and everything. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's smack in the middle of the 70s, you know? Right. Yeah. 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 Band on the Run is very cool, though. That album is a very cool album. You know, I think it's Paul's best work post Beatles for sure. But it's his most enduring album, I think. But it's very interesting, the the nature of it feeling old or dated or that type of thing. And I've appreciated McCartney over the years, but it's just not the same, you know. And I've been to many of his concerts, and there's just magic when he plays the Beatles songs. It's just different from, from the stuff. Although I did see him recently at SoFi, and the Wings material is starting to catch up now. And I think because people are a little older... And I think it's because they're remembering that time. Like he did Let Me Roll It. He did Let Him In, which I've never seen him do. You know, and people would dismiss songs like Let Him In, but people loved it, you know. Yeah. It's great. But if he, I feel like if he did For No One, people would lose their minds because he never yeah. does that, you know. And to me, For No One, For No One sounds more timeless than Let Him In. Let Him In sounds dated. And it was written 10 years before. How is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> I completely agree. Yeah. I mean, stuff that was recorded in 1966 like for no one off a of revolver that stuff it it does not compare to the other songs that were in 1966 like the mamas and the papas that is right. very much the 60s and i wasn't Absolutely. even alive then to know or compare thousand percent true in fact if you really go to the billboard top uh 20 or whatever it's even more glaring you know when you think of because now there's a wide you know, a, a, range, a ranging of songs and everything. So much stuff's like, man, this was old for 1966. Like, how did this get yeah. <laughs> You know, like, how, you know, you couldn't listen to that six months after that was up there. You know? <laughs> so it's amazing. Like, a song like Paperback Writer still sounds good to my ears. Yeah. I, it still sounds good to my ears. Rain, still an amazing song. It's one of my, that, that's my favorite Beatles single, actually. Rain? Paperback Writer, Rain. You know? Yeah. The, the A B. When you talk about singles, what's the A B, you know, combo platter? Oh yeah. Yeah, that single's just so incredible. I mean, just Paul's bass playing alone oh. is just so electric. In both of them. It's incredible. Yeah. So Larry, when did you decide that you want to be a writer? Sure. So in a nutshell, I was I started as an action stand up comic. And Stand-up comedy was really my full-time job. You know, you audition for things and all that kind of stuff. But I, I started in theater. But when I was doing that, I realized there were limited things that were available for me to audition for, you know. And I'll, I'm just doing the short version of it. So I thought that if I learned how to write and produce television, I could create a space for myself. So Hollywood doesn't have to try to figure out who I am. I can create a space for myself. So that's what... So that's what got me started in television. Before that, you know, just getting into stand up and all that, you go up on stage and you try it out, and, you know, it's you're terrified, but you keep doing it because you're crazy and you're a maskist and all that stuff. And, and eventually you have an act, and that's basically how stand up works. But getting into television is different. I consciously wanted to create a space for myself. And my first job was on, it was called Rick D's Into the Night. This is even before you were born. And, Six months later, I got a job in A Living Color. It was a big show at the time, sketch show. A lot of people came out of that show. And that was kind of my big break was getting a job on that show. And have the Beatles had any influence on your career at all? 
I don't know about career, but definitely life. Just because they've been a part of it. One of my best friends in the world is Mark Benia. He's a very talented musician. He's played with a lot of famous people and stuff. He's one of like the best guitars in the world. I just happened to meet him, happenstance, in the late 80s. I was playing at a comedy club his wife was working at. And uh, we just were talking and stuff, hit it off. And, and she told me, I, I think the Beatles came up or some kind of way. They usually came up in conversation some kind of way. And she was saying our husband was a big Beatles fan, you know, and I ended up meeting him and we bonded over the Beatles. Oh, wow. <laughs> this was in the late eight, And we have been fan. We've been friends and fans ever since. In fact, he went with me to the McCartney concert recently, you know, and we would when something like in those days, you know, pre-internet days, you know, like you would wait for like bootlegs to make a, make their rounds, you know, right. we go, Oh man, there's this bootleg of this, you know, outtakes, you know, from the white album. Like what, you know, we have to get together <laughs> and listen to it. What is that? So we would have listening parties of that outtakes and things like that. And, and uh, material that we hadn't heard, you know, that kind oh, of stuff. Was, oh, it was so much fun because it was, a, you know, you get together and you listen to it and you couldn't believe, Oh man, I had never heard that version of that. That's amazing. You know? And there yeah. was so little of that material that was out at the time. Now there's so much of it, you know, right. but there was very little at that time. So the, you were so familiar with the official versions of things. You really didn't hear the variations of things, you know? Mm -hmm. So that, that was a, a very cool thing. So my personal life, I kind of, I've had friends that through the Beatles, I've kind of bonded with and that type of stuff, like as the opening thing, but professionally, not so much. There just hasn't been much of an intersection. You know, I'm trying to think right now if that's played out. I don't think so, but I've always wanted to do something that has to do with that. I have no idea what it is, but you know, I just did this podcast. It's a trivia thing. And my expertise was Beatles lyrics and, they had a special guest come on and it was Peter Asher. So I got to meet Peter Asher. And he, was, oh, wow. he was on video, but it was so cool, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's the closest I've come to, you know, that type of thing. I saw, I saw Paul McCartney at a restaurant once. No way. And I was walking by and I was like, man, should I say that? I go, no, people say something all the time. And then I thought it'd be great to just say, excuse me, guys, to just say something to someone else at the table and just ignore Paul. <laughs> 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 of, or hand Paul a camera and say, could you take a picture of us? Real quick? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. You, know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. know, but I just didn't have the nerve. Just didn't have the nerve. You know, that's that's the closest I've come to meeting a Beatle. I guess you could say it was walking, walking by me. I don't, I mean, I could take the pictures, but I don't know, you know, you know, you know. <laughs> what are you going to say? I was just going to say, like, I would totally love to play around with that if I knew that there was going to be a second chance of meeting him. Yes. But if like, that was my one and only shot, I... Absolutely. Thousand percent. Now, now, there was somebody did a movie a little while ago. Was it called Yesterday? Did you see that yes. movie? Yes. Yes, I've seen Where that the world forgot about the Beatles or the Beatles when it was like they never existed type of thing. Yeah. I find that very interesting to do something creative around Beatle things or that type of thing. Mm. I thought was pretty cool. You know, any possibility of that in the future from you? I have no idea. I mean, I mean, I have no idea to be honest with you. I don't, I'm very idea driven, you know, I come up with ideas and then hopefully it's something. So I just, I don't have an idea for anything like that, but, you know, who knows? It'd be great if I did. Well, speaking about creative projects and the Beatles, you have a podcast episode where you interview one of the editors from the Peter Jackson Get Back documentary. Yes. What were your thoughts about that whole Get Back project and the remastering of the film? It was great. Now, so, like, it's funny because the film Let It Be, like, I saw it in the theaters in the, in the 80s when I was first into the Beatles, too, you know, and had that experience of what it, that it was so dreary watching it and everything. And, you know, those were some of the first type of bootleg stuff was from Let It Be and those is probably those get back sessions I remember listening to back in the day. It's kind of interesting. So it's interesting seeing all that, the way that Peter Jackson put it together and all that. I found it real fascinating. I think it's not for everybody because it's a lot of Beatles to take. That's hours and hours of Beatles. Yeah. I mean, for us, it's like dessert just keeps coming yeah <laughs> it's like there's this movie albert brooks called made called defending your life i don't know if you ever saw this film mm -mm. but 
he dies and he goes to this place where they decide if you're going to move on or not. He doesn't know if it's heaven or whatever, but in this place, you can eat whatever you want and you never get full. And he's like, this is amazing. You know, <laughs> you can eat things. And that's what it felt like watching that. Like, I could watch all these Beatles and I'm just never full. I don't know what it is. I can just keep watching more. You know? But I found so many moments in there just fascinating. The coolest one of all of them was seeing Paul just invent Get Back, right? Mm. Right on screen. I don't remember that moment in Let It Be. I didn't, I don't think it was quite like that, you know? I think it was a little jumbling in that, but to see the way, you know, he kind of had that idea in his head and they were just waiting for John to show up, you know, <laughs> basically. <Yeah. laughs> and just jamming, you know. But it was interesting to see how just bored they were in that studio and everything. And I think John was, John might have been doing heroin at the time or something too, I think, because he was kind of out of his mind for most of it hanging with Yoko. But I found it very, very cool. It was like, it was Christmas before Christmas. And Have you found any comparisons between their creative process and your own? Now, yeah, so the Beatles inspired me from the creative standpoint, absolutely. One of the, one of the reasons why I think I got into the Beatles, when I was growing up, I... I would always, I got into different personalities over the years and I, I like launched into them. I'll say the way I kind of launched into the Beatles, I kind of learned everything about them. If I was into magic as a kid, you know, I still do, you know, do sleight of hand, that type of thing. And the first personality that I kind of attached to as a kid was Houdini, you know, I was like, how could somebody be so big? This is crazy. You know, I mean, his word is like an adjective, you know, it's a common word, you know. So I, I read everything I could get my hands on about Houdini when I was growing up. And after that, it was the Marx Brothers, you know. They were just so funny to me. I just couldn't believe that they could be so funny. I wanted to know everything about them and films. In college, Buster Keaton was one. I'm still a huge Keaton fan. And then it was the Beatles, you know. It's like just immersing yourself into people and what made them special. Like what what was the creative process, you know, when I look at that period that Keaton had between 1920 and 1928, it's just unparalleled to me, just the creativity that he had during that time, you know. And people keep rediscovering Keaton about every 15 to 20 years, which is kind of fascinating. But Houdini will be rediscovered again also. He's kind of dormant right now, but he had a genius for marketing. He's the, like, people think, like, with Instagram and social media and all that, you know, you know, that they're geniuses in the market. Houdini was a genius before anybody was a genius about self-promotion and all that stuff. And he backed it up with like just being really, really good at what he did, you know. So when I look at the Beatles especially and I look at their musicology, it's very inspirational in terms of a combination of always wanting to push in another direction, do something different, not repeating yourself. Don't go sideways. Definitely don't go backwards. Go forward. If you're going to look backwards, like let it be, get back. You're doing it more authentically now. You know, you have different shoes on while you're doing it, mm. you know, you know, that type of thing. So I've always tried to, that's inspired me to try to do that in my work. Always be pushing in another direction or that type of thing, for sure. Do you have a favorite Beatle? I do not have a favorite Beatle. I've been asked this question. I've thought about it long and hard, and I just don't, you know, I, it's not a cop out, you know, I really like the entire group for different reasons, you know, yeah. and I appreciate the four of them for different reasons. It's the chemistry of the four of them that I like, mm -hmm. you know, I like, I like the Beatles, like I said, Lennon, McCartney, Harrison, Ringo on their own, I find them likable, but I'm not as enamored of them the way I'm as enamored of them as a group as the Beatles. Right. You know, but I, I do find them interesting on their own. But I never if the Beatles had not existed, I would not be a huge fan of them individually like the way I am because of the Beatles. Oh, OK. I see that. That's really interesting. Yeah. So if I take away the Beatle period, I go, yeah, those guys are OK. Yeah, they're cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be in the same category as other people from that era for me. I could see that. Yeah, and even his live shows now, half of his set list would be gone if you were to take away the Beatles catalog. I think the magic of it would be gone. It's the magic of that which makes the Wayne stuff very good too. You know, 
one of a cool thing to listen to. I love history and that kind of stuff. One of the things oh, I love about too. history is I love to know what the contemporary account of something is rather than the look back, hmm. you know? So I love hearing audio of things that happen at the time, you know, mm-hmm. or people who have written accounts of things that happen in the moment, you know, as opposed to a historian's take on it or a intellectual's take on something, you know, like what's fascinating about some films sometimes, especially films that are documentaries, like of something in the thirties, like what, what was the food that people, what was the junk food people had back then? Or what was the trend that was going, that doesn't always make it in the movies of the time or that type of thing. What's the slang, you know, that type of stuff. And one of my favorite things to watch is seeing the film of, I think it's Wings Across America or when Paul was first, first playing the Beatles songs in concert. And I love to see the audience reaction to it, you know, because it's the first time they get to hear this since the Beatles toured in 1966, you know, so it's been a good 10 years, just about almost, you know, and they lose their mind when he goes into yesterday, you know, but just the first, and they don't, people don't, I love to see the early ones. There's like a, there's also concert footage from the early parts of the tour, like in Australia and that type of thing. So people don't know what's coming up. They don't know what the set list is. It's not like today. It's it's published on the internet or whatever. Right. And so, you know, he's doing all the wing stuff and, you know, it's it's good and it's popular at the time because it's on the radio. But then you hear him, he goes into Lady Madonna, you know, to, and they lose their minds because of what? Yeah. Wait, we're getting Beatles stuff tonight? What the fuck's going on? You know, and I love hearing that. You know, it's very exciting to still hear and then, you know, going into Blackbird, they just, they're just they just done, you know, yeah. <laughs> following it up with yesterday, you know. And then he doesn't do any more after that, you know. But, but I love listening to that for the historical aspect of it, to see how people reacted to the first time an ex-Beatle was really doing Beatles songs. That's know? a really interesting Cause lens. Because they, they kind of shied away from it. They didn't want to, you know, it wasn't, you know, there was kind of a bitter breakup and, you know, you know, you might seem like oh well, that's all you have is that Beatles stuff to do <laughs> right. i mean now yeah. it's like ridiculous how what do you mean you're not gonna play that yeah. stuff you know <laughs> i saw paul in his flowers in the dirt tour in 1989 i think 1990 oh how was that and that was that was a great period because like he still had a lot of strength in his voice then too and he wasn't shy about doing Beatles stuff then either you know and Flowers in the Dirt actually had a lot of great stuff on it. He he wrote some stuff with Elvis Costello and that type of thing. So that was pretty cool. And but he did he did songs like Things We Said Today, which I'm like, yes, you know, you never get to hear something like that, a Beatles song live. You know, I don't think he's done it since. So I got to see him do that on stage, you know, and they did a little different thing with the ending and everything. It's pretty cool. Oh, I gotta check that out. You know, another great piece of like contemporary views is there's this clip from the show American Bandstand from like 1967, like a month before the Beatles released Sgt. Pepper. Mm. And there's this group of American teenagers reacting to like the brand new songs, Strawberry Fields Forever and I Penny love Lane. That. love that. And the audience was split. Like half were thinking it's cool and it's, you know, it's the coolest thing they've ever heard. Wow. And the other half were saying like, Ah, oh, the monkeys are better, and I'll never pay to see the <laughs> yes, Beatles perform. Exactly. It's just exactly. so funny to see those views. What did you think of that? That is great. <laughs> what did you think? I don't like their hair. Their mustache. They didn't dig the mustaches, huh? Eh? What did? What was your comment? I don't know. They look. They looked older, and it ruins their image, really. Mm-hmm. How did you feel? That was funny. And you? I liked it. They're ugly. <laughs> <laughs> their mustaches were weird. <laughs> Come on back here. At least they went out with a twist. Look like grandfathers or something. Shit, man. Look like somebody's grandfather. I love that kind of stuff, you know. Phil Collins, who was actually in the movie Hard Day's Night, he was one of the kids in the audience. He talked about when, you know, he couldn't be a bigger Beatles fan than he, you know, and he was like inspired to be a musician himself. So he said when Rubber Soul came out, he thought the Beatles just were crazy. What are they doing? They just lost their mind, you know. <laughs> what is this? I what is this crap that I had to buy? And he said, within a week, he couldn't do without it. Wow. He could not do without it. That's how it didn't take very long at all for him to not be able to do without it. So that's very <laughs> interesting. Hey, uh, can I get your opinion about this? What is it that makes the Beatles always 
relevant and always contemporary? I don't know. It's a good question, Jack. I don't know if I have an answer for that. You know, I don't know if it's enough to say it's the alchemy of, you know, I mean, it certainly is one plus one plus one plus one equal a hundred, you know? Yeah. But it's, I wish I could pin it down, right? He says, well, if you knew that, we'd be managers, you know? <laughs> as, as John would say. <laughs> I mean, he kind of tried to answer it from the beginning, right? <laughs> I mean, they kind Great of answer. answered that question. <laughs> we've been managers. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, that news conference has all the answers. Uh, yeah. I had one yesterday. No, it's true. Yeah. We had one yesterday. We all do. <laughs> <laughs> they're saying uh, you're the british elvis presley that's not true <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny because one of my favorite films that mocks all of that is the ruddles now i'm sure you've seen the ruddles yes right? yeah the ruddles is brilliant and eric idol made that in like 1978 you know that's how long ago he made the ruddles and it still holds up you know and in fact the narrative of the ruddles Ruddles is a lot like the Malcolm McDowell thing that actually came after the Ruddles, which is kind of ironic, though I don't think he watched it. But just the way he's so dramatic in his proclamation of, you know, <laughs> the Beatles thing. And just the songs like, ouch, instead of yeah. help. <laughs> <laughs> ouch, ouch, ouch. <laughs> or hold my hand, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's so funny. And what's funny about it is that it lampoons it but the Beatles music doesn't suffer as a result of the lampooning yes. because so, some things that get lampooned never recover from the lampooning of it, mm -hmm. you know, and that didn't happen with the Beatles. The lampooning of it didn't have an effect on it at all. Yeah. It's, it's very, very, very curious. Yeah. Most things are, cannot survive a lampooning. Like they're not the same afterwards once you stick a pin in it and just, de and deflate it. But it, yeah. Nope. <laughs> it's not, you know, I don't get it. I don't understand it. I honestly don't, you know. I mean, a little bit of Sinatra kind of stands the test of time in some ways. You know, Sinatra kind of, I mean, when you think about it, the people that had that type of thing, like Frank Sinatra, maybe Bing Crosby, you could argue, but Frank Sinatra had the Bobby Soxers and the girls went crazy and that type of thing. After him, it was Elvis was the next thing. You know, it's kind of happened like almost every decade. So match in the 40s, Elvis in the 50s, and the Beatles in the 60s. I feel like the 70s, maybe the Bee Gees. Kind of, I mean, I don't know. In a sense, Michael Jackson in the 80s certainly had the Beatles kind of thing. You know, 90s, I'm not sure. You know, I'm not sure if there is. You could maybe Beyonce has had that type of thing to some extent, you know. But it's kind of rare where you have, you're that group or that person that you're just at the top in terms of the fascination from the audience. And it's kind of, you're in a place by yourself type of thing, you know. But why the Beatles endure is beyond me. Because all the people that I mentioned still don't hold a candle to all the Beatles music that there is, you know. Yeah, and it came out in such a short period of time, too. Yeah. All these other artists were making music across the span of decades, which is still something that's really crazy to me. Exactly. Larry, what have you been up to recently? Are you involved in any projects right now? Well, I'm putting out a new Beatles record. No. Um, <laughs> What's it called? <laughs> it's, it's called Tomorrow Now Knows. You know? <laughs> we thought tomorrow would never know, but we find out that we've just learned that tomorrow actually now knows. So tomorrow <laughs> is going to tell us all the information we wanted. Apparently, we wanted to know from tomorrow. So... <laughs> By the way, I don't know if you were a Mad Men fan. You're kind oh, yeah. of young when they came in, but you know the episode where Don Draper plays "Tomorrow Never Knows" at the end. Of the episode. I mean, I don't think that song has ever sounded better than on that episode of Mad Men. I mean, yeah. they just boosted the sound of it and everything, and it just it sounded amazing. I'm like, oh my god, listen to this thing! Yeah. And of course, he just eh, takes it off. What is this crap? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great, you know. What a great montage. Oh, yeah. It was really amazing, you know. But I have a company that is set up at NBC Universal, and I'm developing shows there as we speak. I have a drama, a couple of comedies, animated show, a lot of different projects happening. 
There's also a drama that I produced with Kerry Washington that is coming out on Hulu in the fall called oh, wow. Reasonable Doubt. I'm a producer of that. You know, I do on-camera stuff now and then. I do my podcast every week or, you know, three times a month pretty much. And I'm in a movie called Jerry and Marge Go Large right now on Paramount Plus where I'm acting alongside Brian Cranston and Nett Binning, which is a lot of fun. So I mix it up with the things that I'm doing, interested in and that kind of stuff. I'll probably be doing a little bit more in front of the camera again, probably in the next year or so. Nice. Yeah. So there Oh, you that's go. exciting. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Thanks, Jack. Well, cool. It was nice talking to you about this Beatles stuff. Yeah, Larry, thank you so much for coming on, man. It was really an honor talking to you. The honor was all mine. You know, and, you know, who knows? You go into someone's office, probably yours, Jack. You know, <laughs> when you talk about these things. I mean, I don't know when this podcast comes out. That's what he calls it. You know, but who knows? <laughs> I mean, five years, I mean, I'll be a podcast. You, know, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to leave you there. <laughs> the Junctures from Liverpool, England. The Beatles have held this title for eight years. My model of business is the Beatles. You know, they were four very talented guys. Thank you all for listening to another episode of the Here, There, and Everywhere podcast. I'm Jack Lawless. Thank you, Larry, for coming on and for all of your humor and stories. Everybody go follow Larry on Twitter and go check out all of his projects. The links to everything will be in the podcast description. As always, I will see you next week.